Our next session today will focus on attention spectrum disorders. Brain communication networks need our attention. This will be presented by Dr. Vasilius Zakopoulos, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Sciences. He is the director of the Human Systems Neuroscience Laboratory. Dr. Zakopoulos' research focuses on the study of organization of cortical brain circuits and their disruption in disease. Welcome, Dr. Zakopoulos. Today, I will give you some highlights of our work here in the, in the Human Systems Neuroscience Laboratory uh, here at Sutton College. Our work uh, revolves around the study of brain connectivity that shapes brain function and specifically attention. Attention relies on the interactions of cognitive and emotional processes of the brain through a complex neural communication network. This talk will highlight our effort to improve our understanding of fundamental mechanisms uh, and circuit interactions under underlying attention, cognition, and emotion. And uh, because we're doing all this work because attention and the underlying mechanisms are consistently disrupted in most brain disorders. And uh, that's why we need to start focusing on what I call attention spectrum disorders. Let me give you just a few examples of how attention is disrupted in brain disorders. On one hand, we can have excessive distractibility or inability to focus attention. This is typically seen in attention deficit disorders or schizophrenia. On the other hand, we might have extreme focus of attention or difficulty shifting attention, typically seen in autism spectrum disorders, and uh, it can be the case in obsessive compulsive disorder. In anxiety disorders, we see focused attention on the outside world through a constant search for external threats. Whereas in mood disorders, we see the opposite. We see focused attention on inner thoughts. Patients feel trapped in negative, internal negative thoughts and feelings. Um, therefore, attention is a key process in health and disease. But how can we study this process? Well, there are many ways. But our approach focuses on the study of the structure and function of the brain at multiple scales. First, at the systems level, we're trying to figure out which brain areas are connected and how. Therefore, we study brain pathways. At the cellular level, we're trying to figure out which types of neurons communicate and how. And here, you can see neurons labeled with green and their pathways, pathways that communicate with these neurons labeled with the red color. I, we can zoom in further and look at these interactions at the subcellular level, looking at points of communication at the synaptic and molecular scale. At all levels, we're trying to uh, identify changes underlying neuropathological conditions. Now, we focus on uh, frontal cortices. Frontal cortices are highlighted in yellow in the images that you're looking at now. These uh, areas are generally involved in what is known as executive control, that is goal-oriented and flexible behavior. Importantly, they are at the core of attentional processes in all mammals. Animals, and especially humans, can focus attention on relevant stimuli uh, by taking in myriads of inputs, filtering out irrelevant distractions, and uh, frontal cortices play a key role in these processes especially prefrontal cortices, which are at the front of the brain, uh, behind our foreheads, have expanded significantly in primates, that is humans and monkeys, and this is why we study these networks primarily in humans. However, depending on the questions that we have, we can use uh, animal models uh, to dissect these uh, circuits further through more complicated experiments. Before I continue, I will just very briefly describe a few key experimental approaches that we use. Now, we study brain circuits by injecting neural tracers in order to label brain connections. Injection of neural tracers requires imaging or MRI-guided neurosurgery, carefully planned in three dimensions so that we can target areas accurately. We can then visualize brain pathways after we cut sections that are paper thin and stain cells and pathways with multiple colors and look at them under the microscope at very high magnification. Now, under the microscope, we can quantitatively study very large populations of neurons and their pathways, and uh, their pathways and their synaptic points of 
synaptic contacts, uh, points of communication. Now we can study the morphology of neurons. Uh, we can study their distribution and plot their distribution in three-dimensional models of the brain. And in this image, every color dot is one neuron. We can uh, look at the pathways and zoom in, and zoom in further, and look at these uh, pathways and their points of communication at very high, high, uh, at high magnifications. Now, so we can basically e examine interactions of neurons shown here in red and the pathways that can communicate with those uh, neurons shown here in green. We can look at these interactions at very high magnification at the synaptic level and even label these uh, uh, interactions and pathways and look at them at very, very high magnifications under the electron microscope where we can look at the synaptic and molecular interactions. So we use these methods to study the structural and functional organization of the brain uh, and specifically circuits that underlie attention, decision making and their disruption in a number of neurodevelopmental, anxiety and mood disorders like autism, schizophrenia and depression. I will highlight this with two sets of studies. The first set of studies uh, focuses on brain circuits that flexibly control attention. Now, these uh, studies have received significant scientific and media attention and have led to the development and optimization of uh, high resolution uh, methods that span multiple neuroscience disciplines uh, and that have allowed us to the ability to study human brain circuits at an unprecedented level of detail. I will illustrate this with a second set of studies that focus on frontal brain networks that redirect attention, mediate social interactions, and modulate emotional responses, and uh, their disruption in autism. Now, these uh, sets of studies have also received significant uh, scientific and media attention and have been uh, cited among the top research advances by NIH. Now, in the first set of studies, we focused uh, and described for the first time a network linking prefrontal cortices, which, is the, which are the executive of the brain, with the amygdala, which is basically an area in the brain that is the center for emotions, and the thalamic reticular nucleus, which is a part of the brain that surrounds the, the core of the brain. It acts as a filter, so any information that reaches our cortex for further processing has to go through it and is gated there. We saw that these areas interact, and we showed for the first time how they interact in any species. Now, this specialized network is strategically positioned to filter relevant from irrelevant information, focus and shift, uh, help us focus and shift attention on emotional or very significant stimuli, and switch from perceiving the outside world to perceiving our inner thoughts. So it seems that this network forms a core brain interface for cognitive and emotional interactions. In the second set of studies, we focused on the organization of frontal brain circuits in humans that underlie attention and decision making and their disruption in autism. Attention in autism is a major consideration since, since extreme focus of attention, inflexibility and difficulty in shifting attention are uh, hallmark symptoms of autism spectrum disorders. They're consistently present in low and high functioning individuals alike. Now, functional, anatomical, and genetic studies have shown that brain networks in autism are generally desynchronized. They can be hyper or hyperactive, depending on which areas we examine, uh, with scrambled communications, altered synaptic function, and neuronal excitability, and even gross changes in the gray and white matter of the brain. But how does this disruption in attentional mechanisms come about in autism? Well, to answer this question, we looked at networks of frontal brain areas that are involved in attention using post-mortem human brain tissue. We looked at axons. Axons are the cables that connect neurons and transfer signals between them. So axons, as you can see in these images, look like electrical wires. And if we cut them, uh, we, they, they look circular, and we, we can see a dark ring su surrounding them, which is the insulating myelin. Uh, these images are from an electron microscope. When we looked at axons, we found that there are more and thinner axons that branch more and express growth factors in autism. That suggested local overconnectivity. On the other hand, there are fewer thick axons that travel far, and that suggested long-distance underconnectivity. 
And this uh, can be seen in this three-dimensional reconstruction of axons. I should mention we have looked at millions of individual axons in postmodern human brain tissue. And you can see axons in uh, brains from uh, individuals uh, with autism are thinner, and uh, more color suggests uh, higher branching, increased branching. These findings, combined with a weaker fine control of brain activity through reduced inhibition that we also described for the first time, suggest that focal changes in prefrontal areas can disrupt widely brain networks and scramble communications. To summarize, I showed you that we study the organization and dynamic interactions of circuits that control attention, cognition, and emotion. We study the disruption of these networks and the network dynamics. So we study the disruption of neural communication and the balance of excitation and inhibition. And then we put all this data together to model network interactions in order to better understand pathology. Now this work continues, and we're currently studying, examining critical periods, factors, and processes that can have an effect on uh, the development of attention net attentional networks in children and adults. We're particularly interested in epigenetic factors uh, that may disrupt neural communications. For example, there are, there's a very long list of substances that fall under the general category of uh, uh, estrogen disruptors, like bisphenol A found in plastics, some antidepressant drugs and immunosuppressive drugs, that could have an effect on action growth. And we're trying to narrow down optimal windows for potential therapeutic interventions. Moreover, we are trying to combine our very high resolution invasive procedures that we use to study brain pathways with non-invasive imaging processes, uh, approaches that we can use in humans in order to validate these tools and improve their accuracy, both for research and clinical applications. This is just some of our work here at Sargent College uh, at the Human Systems Neuroscience Laboratory and the Neural Systems Lab. We've had and continue to have the privilege of working with a team of outstanding researchers, graduate students, and collaborators, and our work has been funded by NIH, the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and Autism Speaks. Finally, this work would not have been possible without the support of brain tissue banks and the precious gift of post-mortem brain tissue from donors and their families. Thank you for joining Health Matters.